Hi there, Aaron Walter here. If you're hearing this, you're not currently on our premium subscriber feed. Design Better Premium subscribers enjoy weekly episodes, four episodes per month in total, rather than two, all ad-free and invitations to our monthly AMAs with the smartest folks in design and tech. You'll hear a preview of this episode, but if you'd like to hear the full conversation, please consider becoming a premium subscriber at designbetterpodcast.com slash subscribe. It's just $7 a month, and it supports not only your personal growth, it also makes our work at Design Better possible. The podcast is available to everyone through our scholarship program. If you can't afford a subscription, email us at subscriptions at thecuriositydepartment.com, and we'll help you out. I make groovy stuff that I hope people's heirs will fight over in the future. That is my goal as a designer. And in order to do that, I really feel like it's very important to have a very broad understanding of design history. This is Design Better, where we explore creativity at the intersection of design and technology. I'm Eli Woolery. And I'm Aaron Walter. I've admired Jonathan Adler's work for a long time. Though he started his career as a potter, today he designs sumptuous furnishings and interiors that inject energy and joy into everyday life. His work is decadent, but it's definitely not frumpy and always delivered with a winking sense of humor. If anyone truly knows how to bring creativity into all aspects of life, it's Jonathan Adler. We speak with Jonathan about why every creative person needs a naysayer to rebel against, how he surrounds himself with things that make him happy, and how he balances the tension between creating objects that have a lot of color and contrast while making sure everything works together. By the way, my wife, Courtney, has listened to many, but not all, of our episodes, and this one happens to be her favorite so far. So you're in for a treat. Brace yourself for some adult language. We'll return to the conversation after this quick break. Support for Design Better comes from our friends at Crash Plan. Visit CrashPlan.com slash Design Better for 50% off your first year of Crash Plan. You may have heard horror stories of people being locked out of their Apple or Google accounts and losing decades worth of precious files like family photos. That's why I've been using Crash Plan for a decade and a half now to back up all my important files. Crash Plan works efficiently in the background while you work, encrypting and sending all your new or changed files up to their secure cloud every 15 minutes. And they make it simple to restore some or all of your data. With unlimited version retention, Crash Plan can also be your ultimate rewind button. Businesses of all sizes benefit from Crash Plan's multi-tenant capabilities. Buy as many user licenses as you need and easily manage them all from under one account. Go to CrashPlan.com slash design better for 50% off your first year of Crash Plan. That's CrashPlan.com slash design better, all one word, for 50% off your first year. Back up better with Crash Plan. And now, back to the show. Jonathan Adler, welcome to Design Better. Thank you so much. It is a pleasure to be with you guys. I got to say, the pleasure is all ours. I'm such a big fan. I look at one of your beautiful chandeliers above my dining room table every morning. I really love it. And I love what you're doing. And I love the way that you've built a creative life for yourself and also a creative life for other people, a way for people to discover a creative way to live. And that's a big part of what we want to talk about today. But before we do, maybe we could start from the early days. I know you went to RISD and as many hero stories begin, there's the hero and a nemesis. And you've said in a past interview Every creative craftsperson should have a naysayer to rebel against. Could you unpack that story for us? Um, Yes, I shall. First of all, I hope you guys don't get to know me too well, because I always say to not know me is to love me. So um, I hope you get (laughs) the exact right dose. So such recommendations may vary. And I also just want to say thank you for saying that maybe I inspire others to lead creative lives, because that's actually kind of always been a low-key goal of mine. So Mm -hmm. that. As excited as I am to live a creative life, I would be 
equally delighted to learn that I have inspired others. So cool. Thank you. As for the naysayer to rebel against, I feel so bad because it's like one of those stories that I've kind of dined out on for my entire career about how I actually went to Brown for college. And then I at RISD um, next to Brown, I spent a year just sort of taking classes and wanted to get an MFA. And my teacher was like, no, you suck. You have no talent. And I sculpted away and decided I would show her. And look, this is over 30 years ago. So it fits very nicely into kind of a pat narrative. It's a satisfying Oprah-ish narrative. And there's truth to the Oprah-ness of it. And I do think there's a lot to be said for having a naysayer and Mm -hmm. It's so funny, in a world in which everyone talks about having a mentor, mentor this, mentor that, I always say, I've never had a mentor, but I've had plenty of tormentors, and I think they (laughs) are probably something people should try to find more than they try to find a mentor. Ultimately, for creative life, I think having a tormentor is better than a mentor, because Mm -hmm. at least in my experience, sort of being a a maverick and uh, charting my own course has kind of been the key to my whole jam. So glad I was never mentored. Feel bad about always slagging off that RISD professor who was named Jackie Rice, who told me I didn't have any talent. She didn't see that I was just different and that there's different ways to approach life as a ceramicist. The true takeaway is I think that teachers should look for potential in their students independent of the teacher's own sensibility. I love that story. And it reminds me, I mentioned I teach at Stanford. And when I went through the same program I now teach in, there was a professor named Matt Kahn, who was sort of famous, at least in the art and design world on our campus, for being an extremely harsh, but astute critic. And I feel for me that like, if I brought up something in a design class that he could tell that if I was phoning it in, or if I actually put effort, and even when I was putting an effort, and the result was still kind of shitty, he would lay it out on like, why didn't you take this to the next level? And it got to the point where I really wanted to prove him wrong. Essentially, I wanted to come there and show something that he was proud of. And then the relationship, after I did that a few times, the relationship kind of flipped. And instead of a mentor, it became kind of a mentor. But I'm curious in your own work, I know you're not a teacher or instructor, but how do you think about guiding the people you work with as far as those that are still sort of developing their aesthetic or craft or sensibilities with the projects you collaborate with them on? Well, I have designers working for me, young designers. And I think that obviously I want them to design and work on what I want. I'm kind of the author of everything. However, I hope that they see me as an avuncular figure and that they will look back on their time with me and be like, whoa, bro, that was really cool. Like, huh. And I think that the thing that I really bring to young people in my company, what I try to instill in them is a sense of connoisseurship. I think that academic design has gone in a sort of funny direction. I mean, like design schools have gone kind of a funny direction. In my opinion, people seem to be overly focused on green ideas and computers. And I end up getting kids who've gone through design school and come out non-connoisseurial. And as much as I think everyone should try to do their bit for the environment, I don't think that's the point of design. And I think that a lot of them kind of think it is, at least in my world. Like, I'm sure, you know, there are elements of the design world, such a broad thing. But like, I make groovy stuff that I hope people's heirs will fight over in the future. That is my goal as a designer. And in order to do that, I really feel like it's very important to have a very broad understanding of design history. And whilst I don't like teach a class in design history to my operatives, I make a lot of references that I think they end up learning, understanding. And I've had people who've worked with me forever, so they don't leave. But those who have left, I think probably come away from their experience with just a much, much broader knowledge of design history than they ever would have gotten in design school, which is sad in my opinion. Yeah, design history is all over in your work. It's just all over. In fact, looking at your current catalog, having been to your stores, I went to our school. So, you know, some things pop up to me like the uh, Duchamp pipe 
or this like Hollywood Regency history behind that. And there's a whole bunch of other things, history of photography and so forth, that come together into this sensibility. Could you talk a little bit about how that developed for you? It reminds me a bit of, we talked to David Sedaris, and I think like you, he said, you know, it's too expensive for me to be on my phone because my job is to observe the world. You can't really do your business without just constantly observing the world. Truly appreciate what you just said, and I truly hope that people are able to decode it. I strive to make stuff that is kind of layered and, you know, if you know, you know, kind of references. I guess what I'm trying to do with a lot of my stuff, I want it to be formally spectacular, of course, and elegant, which is a word people don't say too often. By elegant, I mean I want things to have great proportions, and I want to make pieces that stand the test of time and people's heirs will fight over. So that's the baseline for everything I make. But I also strive to infuse some content into what I do. I do have a broad frame of reference. I am culturally voracious. I think the idea of postmodernism in the design sense, not necessarily in like the cultural theory sense, but the design sense of postmodernism that really was sort of the era of my youth was about sampling and about mixing different genres. And I think that idea was very liberating to me. And I think that my work is quite postmodern. As far as the breadth of references and that kind of thing, I'm just a very insular person. And I hope that my work (laughs) reflects a truly idiosyncratic sensibility that is born of insularity. John, to your point about design programs, sort of moving away from design history and teaching about aesthetics, I would wholeheartedly agree. And I think in our program, we're trying to bring that back a little bit, but it's still, on one hand, it's hard in the context of a liberal arts school where these students are spending two years sort of doing broad requirements and then just coming to us for the last two years. We've got to pack a lot of things in. But I do think there's been something lost because we used to have a very direct relationship with the art department. And for various political reasons, that got cut off a number of years ago. But I'm curious if you were to be looking at a designer's portfolio or their experiences that you were wanted to hire onto your team, what are some of the things that you hope that they had read or watched or absorbed along their educational experience? I think that my answer will probably get me canceled and make me seem like a fossil, but I think what I... If you'd like to continue listening to this conversation, you'll need to subscribe at designbetterpodcast.com slash subscribe. Once you do, you'll get access to every full-length episode, all ad-free, monthly AMAs with inspiring people in design and tech, and recordings of all our past AMAs. The podcast is available to everyone through our scholarship program. If you can't afford a subscription, just email us at subscriptions at thecuriositydepartment.com and we'll help you out. Your support makes design better possible. Invest in yourself and the design community by subscribing at designbetterpodcast.com.